Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this initial series, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen with our own pitchers at S2 Breakthrough as we've collected more and more data. Some of the topics we'll cover include how we've shifted the way we understand and train pitch types, how to maximize game day prep, and generally how we use data to create systems and approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. This podcast is sponsored by Yakertech, softball's first in-game optical tracking system and most accurate data capturing solution. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development here at S2 Breakthrough. In today's episode, I want to discuss really what it means to look at a pitcher's data and how individualized a pitcher's story and their ball flight data really is. In the last uh, few episodes, episodes one through four, we talked a lot about you know spin direction and break, uh, how to understand each of these components, how it's related to you know arm action, arm slot, trunk positioning. Um, and so today, what I really want to talk about is to really zero in a little bit more on ball flight data and understand how you know it's it's so individualized, meaning we really can't take a concept of, you know, this pitch needs to do this, this pitch should do this or has to do this and apply it across the board. We have to really understand these uh, layers of individuality and all of these components that go in to a pitcher's story and why her ball flight data looks the way it does. So um, when I'm giving these examples today, I'm going to show you some visuals, some uh, visuals that we have um, on our dashboards where we're plotting break, um, just to be able to show you essentially what this looks like when we're looking at data on the back end. I believe it was last episode, but I talked about, you know, this difference between collecting data and looking at it on the back end versus using, you know, ball flight data on the spot. And so those are obviously the related concepts, but the back end information is the foundation. Basically, after today's discussion, what I hope is clear is that we can't really ask our pitchers to achieve something specific on a particular pitch type unless we know it's back end information, unless we know what that pitcher does, the things that are unique to her and only her. Uh, because what we could likely be doing is demanding something of her or asking her to do something um, that's really not in her realm, not realistic, sometimes not even doable. Um, okay, so let's get into this sort of back end piece uh, that I'm referring to. So in this first picture, uh, what I want to look at is uh, this example of, again, it says all of her median, median break for these four pitches, rise, fast, drop, change up. You know, this is an assessment. She throws all of her pitches. And it's pretty obvious to see here um, that her strength is sync. There's nothing else going on here. So, you know, the fastball was her hardest uh, velo pitch. We have that graph uh, in a different location here, but uh, we have fastball, drop ball, which has about six inches of sink, and that change up that, again, is about seven inches, a little bit of horizontal run. So this drop change mix here is no doubt about it, her strength, that rise ball really uh, doesn't add anything to the story. Um, okay, so if drop ball is her strength, if the ability to produce sink is what she does well, that's at the center of her story, essentially, then when she's throwing this pitch in training, what is really critical is that she understands that. If on any given day, this drop ball is at four inches of break, it's not gonna cut it. It's the center of your story. So it has to sit this six, seven, eight inches of break uh, because that's the pitch that you're really relying on, uh, you know, as far as, again, being the center of your story, the center of your strengths. Now, let's take the same pitch type. So talk about drop ball, which we all know traditionally obviously has top spin, um, and we're looking at a sink pitch here. And I wanna take a look at just this graph to start. And what we can see here is this is just rise fastball. So this pitcher has rise fastball and change. The change up usually just kind of sinks right underneath of that fastball, looks uh, pretty similar to the fastball. Um, and so these are the two pitches she throws. You know, this rise ball on its own, it's got about three inches of up break, which is great, and about three, four inches of horizontal 
horizontal. It just makes the pitch really, really difficult uh, for pitchers, to, for hitters to manage, I should say. Uh, she's really effective using this pitch. And the fastball here we can see uh, is a primarily bullet spin pitch, but with a ton of glove side run. So she's about four or five inches consistently on this fastball. There's no doubt about it. When this pitcher has this rise ball, uh, she's a high school pitcher, this rise ball, this fastball, and pairs that fast with a change. She is really, really effective. Um, but she came to me and said, you know, I want to just explore this year. She's a senior. Before I go into college next year, I want to explore whether or not I can throw something with some top spin. Can I bring a drop ball? I've never been able to. And can I start to essentially add a layer of variability to my tools? Um, because I don't know if what I have right now is going to cut it at the college level. And I thought that was just a really great request. So what I'm going to do here is kind of scroll through and show you, this is just like a few days later, I'm gonna show both of these screens sort of next to each other and then I'll zero in on the one to the right. Uh, and on this particular day, we only threw fast drops, so the, the rise is not plotted. Um, but when we, we're talking about drop ball, talking about topspin, showing our high-speed camera and Repsoto Insight, uh, she was able to successfully throw a topspin pitch. Now it was only about two to three inches, little bit of horizontal run. But now let's take this sort of rise ball here that's plotted to the left and imagine it's also plotted here on the right. And now all of a sudden you can see she successfully is growing you know, her, her separation between her pitches. Do I think that she can grow a little bit more on that drop ball? I'm going to talk about that concept at the end of today's episode um, because that's a little bit complicated, what goes into her ability to produce topspin versus backspin. Um, but for this sake, like if I were to sit there in that training session and say to her on the spot, this drop ball, drop balls are only good at six inches of break. They're only effective if you throw them between this and this. That's would be... That would be inaccurate, be inappropriate to tell her because really what we're looking at is what role are we asking this pitch to play in her story? It is not, we call it X and so it must do Y. It is, you know, we call it whatever we want, but the reality is we have to identify the role in which we need it to play to expand your variability, to make you more effective when you're in competition. And so no doubt about it, uh, this was just really a phenomenal job by this pitcher to now add a layer of variability, whether or not this tool can be something uh, that can grow even beyond this. Again, there's some comp layers to that, uh, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but it is important that we don't see, essentially, not all drop balls are created equal. This is not the center of her strengths, and so it doesn't have to be everything for her. Okay, I'm going to continue to work here. Uh, same conversation, but different pitch type. Now let's talk about curveball. Here's a pitcher. She throws fast, change, drop. Uh, all of them plot identically like a fastball. So in this particular graph, all we see is fast and curve, but fast, change, drop all plot as if they're all fastballs. And there's really nothing significant about that. There's no horizontal run. Uh, it's three to four inches, so not significant uh, sink here. And then she started exploring a curveball. Um, essentially, she was. Uh, what I noticed is that when she was trying to work uh, the, the intent of throwing a curveball, she was really unraveling the arm a little more aggressively is what I started to notice. And so that pitch started to all of a sudden become, uh, you can see it has uh, the ability to really be the drop ball she's looking for. So when she has the intent to throw drop, it really didn't show us anything significant. But now this curveball, you know, it's still four to five inches, so not necessarily significant yet. But you can see it has this like foundation to be her drop ball. So she calls it curve. But looking at what we're what we're really uh, requiring of this pitch, we need if she's throwing all of her pitches at three, four inches of sink, we're looking for a pitch that does something more. And this curveball is what does it. So I could come in to her sessions and say, no, a curveball is supposed to spin like this. It's supposed to have a little bit more till, have more horizontal run. Um, it has to have backspin. That's traditionally what a curveball does and hold her to that. That would make no sense. All we're doing is asking her to find a pitch, to create a pitch that develops a, or creates a little bit more sync. Uh, you know, it's this curveball. It's the intent of a curveball that allowed her to do that. So fine, that's really what we're exploring. So we're going to keep it called curve and we're just going to keep making sure she understands what she's trying to get it to do. Not because that's what curveballs must do, but that's what her curveball has to do to add to her story. So we'll take the same pitch label, the same pitch type, 
Here's a different picture and here's her assessment. We have all of her pitches here uh, plotted here. And you can see her screw and her rise. They're both batsman pitches. Essentially her screw ball is just an angled in rise ball. They're identical pitches. Sometimes she gets a little bit more uh, break on that screw ball. Um, and then she actually, these were new pitches for her. So the drop ball and kind of focusing on, on fastball, drop ball, having some top spin is a new concept for her. And you can see like, you know, she doesn't have any horizontal run, but look how much spread she has vertically between these pitches. And so let's look in the middle here with this curveball. This curveball here, it has a little bit of, of uh, backspin to it, but it's mostly a bullet pitch. Essentially, as she continues to work, she relies a lot on being up in the zone, and that makes sense why. Now, all of a sudden, she's coming. This is a college pitcher um, coming into her sophomore year. She's starting to develop something down, some top spin pitches. That curveball is great where it is. It's a great bridge pitch between these backspin and top spin pitches. It gives her all of a sudden three tiers of separation uh, instead of just, you know, being able to produce two. So I think what's important here is like, she labels this curve, and so did the picture that I sh I showed before this. But they are doing two very different things. It doesn't mean one is good and one is bad. It means that each of those pitches, what they decide to call a curveball, how what their intent is and what they think they're trying to achieve on their hand, is producing two different things. And as long as what it's producing is adding to the story and making this overall uh, pitch profile. Uh, more variable, more effective, that is what we're going for. So we have to get away from this concept of this is what a rise does, this is what a curve does, the best curve balls do this, the best drop balls do this, and start to understand that we could have 10 pitchers sitting across from us and every single one of them produces, uh, is, is equally effective with tools that do different things. And it is not a cookie cutter approach. It's about the overall story. We spend so much time here at S2 really not only gathering information to be able to create a system that we can show the story, but really making sure that we can communicate that story to our pitchers. Because I think, you know, they've been in a world for so long where they think, like, what is a curve supposed to do? Uh, and so instead, now they ask, like, what do I need my curve to be able to do? Um, so when I'm in training now and I'm looking at data on the spot, pitcher A knows any top spin at all is something really positive for me. Even three inches is huge. Pitcher B is like, you know, if I'm anything less than six inches, like I've got to, I got to go to work today. And so they know that about their stories. They understand the differences between those. Um, and that's just something I think that as coaches, we have to start to kind of wrap our brains around and understand uh, so that we are not, you know, treating all pitches like they are exactly equal, no matter what pitcher we're applying them to. Another layer that I want to talk about when we're, when we're talking about the individuality of a pitcher's story and her data is uh, this concept of, uh, you know, making sure that we don't just look at ball flight data in a silo, meaning that we don't just think ball flight data, you know, it stands alone. What we've talked about in previous episodes is that you know, what you can do on the ball is related to what your hand position is, is related to the timing in which you unravel the arm, is related to, you know, arm slot at layback, which is ultimately related to trunk position. It goes back, uh, you know, through the, the kinetic chain, essentially. And so hopefully by, you know, by the time you're listening to this episode, that concept is really clear. And so in addition to understanding that each pitcher their pitch types will provide something different for their story. It's also important to understand that not all pitchers should and can throw everything. Um, and I and I want to kind of give a little bit of some, like an example and go into some of the details of what I mean by that. So uh, the second pitcher that I showed, this is the pitcher that had, you know, the, the rise ball that was up about three inches, a little bit of horizontal run, and that fastball that had a ton of horizontal break. The pitcher that came to me and said, I'd like to go into my freshman year of college with also another tier. I don't want to feel like uh, I, there's a tool that I'm missing. And so what we looked at when we went ahead and looked at all of her data and her assessment information, the reason why she said to me, I've never been able to throw a topspin pitch is because uh, essentially of her body position, her arm position. So what we saw in her assessment is that uh, when she lands at stride foot contact, she's late in her uh, trunk arm timing. So she's already at layback. In addition, you know, because of the body position she's in leading up to that, she's in a little bit more of like internal rotation of the shoulder instead of external rotation. Now, I know you're going to say like, well, then how does she achieve backspin if she's in the opposite arm slot? Well, sh this pitcher has a really unique strategy that when she comes down, she has this last second where she flips or supinates the forearm, 
right before ball delivery. And basically, because she's such so limited in timing between layback and, and ball release, uh, she has time, she flips it, and then as soon as she goes to deliver, it like automatically puts her in position for backspin. That's why she's only ever been able to achieve bullet and backspin. And so what I talked to her about is like, okay, in the long run, getting in a better arm slot, making sure your trunk is moving a little bit more optimally. We're always working on that. We're always tackling that in strength and conditioning in your patterns and such. But if you say, I have this sort of a little bit more of a short-term goal to be able to produce top spin, the number one thing that I think we should attack is trunk arm timing because you have this strategy to flip, but it's the last possible second. And so you flip and you deliver. Now you're asking your arm to not only make that initial flip, but then have to flip again, essentially. And it's out of time to double flip. Now, there's no doubt about it. This is highly inefficient. Like we don't want pitchers just like flipping their forearm back and forth. We're certainly going to, uh, you know, have inefficient ways to transfer energy through the body, through the arm this way. But she's working on that in the long run. She's got her lat mobility is compromised. She's working on that. She has some trunk stability things that she's working on. We know that that's already in her training program that she that's a long-term deal for her. But in the meantime, while she's trying to maximize what she currently has the capacity for, she basically, I felt like if you just give that arm more time, if you land at strife of contact and you're above layback, now you have time to flip and flip again to get a little more behind the ball. And so that's really what we've been focusing on is, uh, you know, giving her a lot more overload, her looking at video back and forth, uh, making sure she doesn't essentially like artificially create so much hike in her launch, which is, you know, ultimately why she's not in good timing and attacking that piece for her then she's able to see, okay, that's what's related to why I haven't been able to produce backspin. So if I can do this and I can do this, or uh, excuse me, why I haven't been able to produce topspin, I should say. So if I can do this with my trunk and I can, you know, get in a little bit better timing, this is what's going to allow that to change. That is so unique to her story. So if I didn't have that information and I just came in and said, okay, pitcher, you know, pitcher B, you are, uh, you know, you have this great rise ball, your fastball looks good. It's, you know, you're able to locate it where you want, you have a good change up, but you need a drop ball. And I'm just like hammering her about being able to throw a drop ball and she's not doing it. This, I think this relationship exists a lot in the pitching world where I, as the coach, basically say, here's how you throw a drop ball. Um, and I, I know how to th- pitchers throw drop balls. I have plenty of pitchers that throw great drop balls. And I'm showing the pitcher this and I'm giving her the drills and we're, we're talking about intent uh, and she's just not doing it. And so it becomes this relationship where like, I'm teaching it correctly. There's nothing more I can do on my end for you. You're just not getting it. Or you're not able to do it. And really, that like that is not remotely what's going on most of the time. What's likely going on is that there's so many details or layers to the story to understand. We have to get rid of this relationship where like the coach teaches it and like that's all we can do. And now it's up to the pitcher whether or not she can get her body to do it. You have to understand essentially like why can't that pitcher do that? What's unique about this particular pitcher in this example is that she has this flip strategy. Most pitchers who land the way she does in the arm position she does don't produce any break. So she has this strategy. So that's amazing, but it does limit her ability to do something else. So uh, we should get her to understand that. Okay, she wants to produce more, and I think that's fantastic. She's trying to stretch, essentially, what she can accomplish and what she can bring uh, on the college stage. But then she has to understand what's keeping her from being able to do that. It's not as simple as, like, you should develop a drop ball, and here's how to do it. And so while I you know, wanted to explain today just how important it is to understand, again, the individuality of what tools pitchers really, what they need from their tools, it's also important to understand when you're asking them to do more with their tools, either grow them, uh, you know, basically expand their story, expand their variability. We also have to know that that is not cookie cutter. Knowing what goes into what that pitcher produces and currently can produce is really, really important so that we don't end up, again, asking her to do something that is just, it's she's not capable of yet. And I think that's on us as coaches. It's our obligation to understand those details so that again, we don't just sort of um, find ourselves putting our position, our pitchers in positions where we're sort of setting them up for failure. So I hope that, uh, you know, those two examples and those two sort of categories of just ball flight data and pitches in relation to one another. And then also again, you know, how body position and uh, arm slot, how it all relates to the individuality of pitchers. So, you know, I have said this time and time again, but, you know, be cautious when you're looking for, for all the parents and pitchers out there, when you're out there looking for, 
you know, the clinic that is going to transform your daughter, um, you know, the single, um, you know, like style that is going to be the end all be all. If I could really preach any message from, uh, you know, going through these episodes in this podcast, it would be that it is so important to understand how individualized the pitching motion is and that what you're looking for is for someone to tell you about for for each pitcher, for your daughter, for the parents listening, what it is that makes her her for other pitching coaches out there. What we're trying to do is to get pitchers to understand who they are and to own who they are, knowing that pitcher A, B, C, everyone lined up next to each other can do very, very different things and likely will do very different things and can be equally effective. So it's not about that comparison. It's about understanding your story, own your story, maximize your story. Um, hopefully all that information was clear. Again, I think this this is just such an important topic. Uh, looking forward to having you know all of you out there listen to and watch this video um, and then hopefully continue this discussion. Social media, obviously, as always, feel free to email me uh, so we can keep this conversation going on just how we can grow this concept, how we can get away from just approaching everything in such a cookie cutter, one size fits all model. Um, thank you so much, as always, for joining. Uh, looking forward to next week's episode where we're going to talk about taking the individuality of a pitcher's tools and talking about how to really maximize them in an in-game approach. So uh, hope you'll join us then. Looking forward to it. And thanks again for joining this week. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on. Quest on.